following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. In the Hindu tradition, there are many symbolic representations of divinity. And it would be very easy to get confused and uh, conflicted between the different representations of God. But it's very important to remember that all representations of God are merely that. They are just images forms that the formless will assume in order to aid his devotees. In its essence, in reality, God is formless. God has no form. God is. And even the word God, unfortunately, in English, bears with it a great burden of assumptions, beliefs, theories, conflicts, wars, and violence. Really, the word God is not accurate either. That's why in the Gnostic tradition, we use a term called absolute. Because it more accurately represents the nature of that which is, from which everything emerges. In every religion, that the primordial source of all existence is represented in many different ways. And those representations change according to time, psychology, and other factors related to the people that that form or representation is there to aid. We began this course about the teachings of the Hindu gods talking about Krishna. But reality is that that word Krishna is symbolic. And we could easily place any of the other Hindu gods as that first lecture, talking about the absolute. And how that nothingness becomes something. In certain traditions of Hinduism, this has been the case. That instead of calling that absolute level of nature... Krishna, they call it other names. Some call it Brahma. This is equally accurate and valid. Some call it Shiva. This is also equally accurate and valid. And some call it Vishnu. And some call it Ganesh or Ganesha. Some call it Prakriti. Some call it Kali or Durga. All of these names are accurate. Because God is not a multiplicity, it is a unity as a multiplicity. All these forms and appearances of God are one and the same. They are forms that make an appearance out of non-appearance, out of a nothingness. So in the previous lectures, we talked about how the absolute, or the prakriti, has different levels and the two primary levels of Prakriti that we discussed were the unmanifested and the manifested. 
These levels of nature are really important to understand if you want to have any understanding of divinity, of what is divine, of what is God, of what is reality. Because at the heart of everything that exists is a non-existence. It is an absolute state, which is without attributes, which is beyond any sort of conception or belief, but is a state of pure, undifferentiated joy. And that level of life is the ultimate goal of all religion and spirituality. This point cannot be overestimated. Unfortunately, in many traditions, people have built idols of the gods in their minds, in their hearts, and fail to see that the idol is a symbol that represents something far beyond the symbol. So when we talk about Krishna, or we talk about Durga, or Lakshmi, or any of the Hindu gods, all of these symbols are doorways into ourselves, into the deepest regions of our true nature. Our inner nature has these levels of manifested and unmanifested absolute within us, not outside of us. The purpose of religion is reflected in the origin of that word, religare, which means to reunite or rebind, to reconnect. And this is identical to the Hindu term yoga, which comes from yug, which means to unite. And this is where we get our word yoke. Our purpose is not to unite with some image of a god or to enslave ourselves to some doctrinal demands that we behave a certain way in order to be a true follower of such and such symbol. Instead, our purpose is to be a manifestation of the unmanifested, to become a god on earth. That is the whole purpose of divinity, is to make us that. That's why we are alive. When we study any religion, this point of view is absolutely critical to bear in mind. It is the loss of that point of view that has caused the decay and corruption of every religion on the face of the earth. It is because we've become trapped in avidya, or ignorance. Avidya is a without, and vidya, knowledge, or gnosis. Avidya is ignorance. It is a lack of knowledge. And the chief characteristic of avidya is to not know oneself. And we don't know ourselves. That's why we get trapped in politics and religions, in materialism, in the pursuit of possessions and money and sex. And we die and are reborn continually because we fail to recognize the truth, which is the unmanifested. The truth is far beyond any symbolic representation of God. So the true devotee of any god, of any symbol, seeks to go beyond the symbol and seeks to become it. And this is the nature or the purpose of all deity yoga. Deity yoga means to seek to unite with a deity or to become that deity. Deity yoga is the basis of all yoga, whether Hindu or Buddhist or any other tradition. It is to seek to become like God. And this is why Jesus said, Be ye perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. That is pure deity yoga. Pure bhakti yoga. To seek that perfection requires that we seek out our imperfection and remove it. This is not an easy task. It doesn't come by beliefs. It does not come by dressing a certain way or attending certain temples. It comes through a rigorous psychological analysis of ourselves. So bearing all that in mind, we will now study Ganesha, who's one of the most easily recognizable gods from any religion because he has the head of an elephant. This elephant-headed god appears very widely throughout all the Hindu traditions. 
And on that note, let me re-emphasize once again that Hinduism is not a single religion. It is a very wide collection of faiths. Many different types of faith. The true name for Hinduism is not Hinduism, because that word relates to a specific region of India. The real word for Hinduism is Dharma. Dharma, which means truth. So Ganesha is one of the gods known throughout Asia and is becoming known in the West. And he has many, many names, many symbols, and a great deal of importance and emphasis in the traditions of Asia, not just in India, but also in China and Japan. So when we study Ganesh or Ganesha, we see these images of a elephant-headed god. His name, Ganesha, means Lord of Hosts. If you've studied Christianity or Judaism, this will sound very familiar to you because Lord of Hosts appears throughout the Bible. It is Adonai Sabaoth. The name Lord of Hosts is derived from his name Ganesha, which comes from Gana, G-A-N-A, in Sanskrit, which means hosts or group or collection or categories. It can also be armies. Any large number of things or people. And Isha, which means master. Gana Isha, master of hosts. His other name that's also used throughout India is Ganapati. Ganesha appears as used mostly in the northern Indian traditions and Ganapati in the south. But Ganapati means the same thing, Lord of Hosts. Another important name for Ganesha that I want to point out right at the beginning is Vinayaka. And this name means without a master. And what that refers to is not one that avoids having a master, but one that excels all masters. There is no master higher, in other words. He is his own master. So these titles are very, very significant. When we look at his symbolism, this is a very typical image of Ganesha sitting on a throne with a pot belly and his elephant's head, holding a trident and other tools in his hands. And the most significant symbols that we see on him, other than the elephant head, are the trident on his forehead and the letter Om on his palm. And sometimes the Om is on his forehead also. You also see a mouse at his feet. Sometimes he's holding sweets, little candied or rice balls in his hands. <clears throat> there are many stories about how Ganesha was born, his origin, how he received his elephant's head, how he is related to the mouse, and many other stories. There are many, many volumes of stories about Ganesha. We don't have time in this lecture to talk about all of that. I encourage you to study them. They're interesting. But for us to understand what Ganesha represents, we have to go deep into his symbolism. Other names for Ganesha include Vignakarta and Vignaharta. And this is probably the way he's most known in Hinduism as Vignaharta which means remover of obstacles. What's not commonly known, especially in the West, by people who are trying to learn Hinduism, is that he is not simply the remover of obstacles, but also the, the placer of obstacles. Not only is he invoked to remove obstacles, but he's the one who puts them there in the first place. Now, if you know anybody who's Hindu or you go to a Hindu uh, temple or if you go to any Hindu ritual or festival, they always begin, always, with invoking Ganesha. 
with prayers, with mantras, with songs. Every significant event in the life of a Hindu begins with the invocation of Ganesha. This is how important Ganesha is. And it's why he's called the Lord of Beginnings. Part of that is to ask Ganesh to remove any obstacles. To clear the way so that the goal of the congregation or the person can be achieved. What is not commonly recognized in that, though, is that he's also the one that put the obstacles there in the first place. And that contradiction has not been well explained in most Hindu traditions. We'll try to talk about that today. Another name for him is Buddhi Priya, which means fond of or husband of Buddhi. Another is Ekadanta, which means one tusk. There are many stories about his tusks his, from his elephant head. And the earliest ones, Ganesh has a single tusk, not two. And this symbolic representation has been explained in many different ways. But what's important is that the word ekadanta has this suffix danta, which comes from dantin, which comes from darshayati, which means to show. And that symbol, the, the single tusk, is intended as a symbol for the one who shows the path, who shows the single way to God. And that's Ganesha's role, to clear obstacles and show the path. And that relates to his other name, Vakratunda, which means the he who straightens out the crooked. Now, many Hindus think that this all relates to if you're going to take a trip or you need to have success in your business, or you want to have success in your marriage, then you call Ganesh and ask him to bless your marriage or bless your business to help with this. Yeah, that's all good. But the real purpose of the symbol of Ganesha is related to spirituality. He who straightens the crooked is he who straightens us. It's because we are crooked. We are crooked with pride, with lust, with anger, and with many other problems. So with his single tusk, he points out the way and removes the obstacles. And in order for him to help us, he places obstacles in our way so that we will see our pride, so that we will see our lust, so that we will see that we have forgotten the reality. Ganesh, this symbol of divinity, represents that part of God in us who puts obstacles in our way in order to teach us about God. Ganesh is represented <clears throat> in Hinduism as being the child of Shiva Shakti, or Shiva Parvati, or also her other name is Uma. And as I explained in the previous lecture about the Divine Mother, Shiva and Shakti are the Symbolic representation of the third Logos, Bina in Kabbalah, which is the aspect of the superior trinity that creates. In Buddhism, this is the Nirmanakaya. It is the body of formation. That level of, of uh, divinity that creates. So, Ganesh is the child of that union of Shiva and Parvati. We see in this image that Shiva has his trident and the om on his hand. These are what he gives to his son, Ganesha. His wife, Parvati, is that divinity the aspect of the Divine Mother, who also infuses her power into her child. So Ganesha represents the collected power of Shiva and Parvati. As I explained before, Ganesha means Lord of Hosts. What that means is, in symbolic uh, mythology and Hinduism, 
is that Ganesha is represented as the chief or general of Shiva's armies. He's in charge of Shiva's military. All of the angels who battle against the demons are under Ganesha's command. Now, I should point out here that in, in uh, exoteric Hinduism, the level of Hinduism that you'll see in the streets and on the internet, Ganesha is displayed much like Krishna or baby Jesus, as a little cuddly baby in the arms of his divine mother, who's a cute little you know, elephant guy with a round bottom and a big belly. And everybody thinks he's really cute. This is not related to the ultimate meaning. Ganesha is also represented as the bringer of wealth and prosperity. And so many Hindus worship Ganesha because they want money. This is mistaken. Many Hindus worship Ganesha because they want success in business or they want power in the world. This is all mistaken. Ganesha is also represented as the source of all wisdom and knowledge. And so even students, before they begin studies in school, the first thing they learn is the Ganesha mantra. So they can chant the mantra when they're doing tests and preparing for their exams in order to try to get Ganesha's help to do well in school. This is great that kids learn that. I wish they learned that in the West, to learn to appeal to God. But ultimately, the knowledge and intelligence that Ganesha represents is not terrestrial. It is spiritual. We see in Egypt the exact same symbol of how divinity, Bina, the third logos, the Holy Spirit in Christian terms, creates a child. In Egypt, this Trimurti, or Trinity, is represented as Osiris and Isis, who have a son, Horus. Horus, in the Egyptian mythology, is the same thing as Ganesha. He is the child of God. He is a son of God. He is an embodiment of divinity who has a mission to accomplish in order to serve divinity and act as their agent. That is Horus's role in Egyptian mythology. It is synonymous with Ganesha. Now, the elephant head, there are many stories that explain why he has an elephant head, and there are many cute Sunday school type stories that are very clever and very much like reading comic books. But they're not the reason that he has an elephant's head. The reason that Ganesha has an elephant's head is because of the symbolism of the elephant. An elephant in Asian mythology or Asian symbolism relates to the mind. And moreover, if you look at the shape of the letter Om, you can see the shape of an elephant's head as in a profile view. You can see a big ear and the face, and sometimes the way it's drawn, you can even see the trunk. And this is why Swami Shivananda pointed out that Ganesha has an elephant head as that is the one figure in nature which is the form of pranava. And pranava is a Sanskrit term referring to om, which is that symbol. The letter or symbol om, or aum, as you probably have noticed if you've studied any religion at all, is always at the beginning. Om. Mani Padmi Hum. Aum is the beginning. Aum is the invocation to call the divine. Aum represents the three primary forces, the Trinity above. They are encoded in that Aum. That Aum is Ganesha. It is the very power of the Trinity manifested. So when we talk about the unmanifested and the manifested, when we talk about the unmanifested level of the Absolute, we're talking about Nirguna, 
Remember I explained in the first two lectures that guna means a modality of nature, or of prakriti. And there are three gunas. The, the unmanifested level of those gunas are nirguna, which is the superior level of the prakriti. When that nirguna moves into activity and manifests, it becomes saguna, which is manifested modalities of prakriti. That boundary between the two is made possible by Aum. The emergence of that light and sound into manifestation is Aum. It is Ganesha. It is the spirit emerging out of creation. It is the son of God who comes through Da'at in Bria, if you've studied Kabbalah. That is Ganesha. This sound Om represents all of that. That's why it is the root mantra of so many religions. Amen. Aum en. The Aum or Om as a symbol contains in itself all the modalities of our own consciousness. Each little aspect of that symbol represents something in us. The little dot at the top represents the true nature of ourselves, our true innermost, that spot or dot that emerges out of the absolute. That is our Ain Sof. And from that emerges the rest. In a future lecture, we may discuss this Om in, in detail. Now, what's interesting is that Ganesha in, in Hinduism is represented as also having a brother. His name is Skanda, among many other names. Kartikeya is another, Subramanya, or Murugan. And you see in this drawing, Shiva representing the ultimate. Shiva is, of course, the third Logos, part of the Trinity above. And we see his wife, Parvati, or Uma, and on her lap, her two children, Ganesha and Kartikeya. Again, on Shiva, you can see the Trinity, not only the Trinity of his staff, the Trinity on his forehead, and the Om on his palm. Those are all his powers, which he passes through his wife, Parvati into his children. Kartikeya, or Skanda, is the god of war in Hinduism. So here we find a very beautiful symbol, which if you've studied Kabbalah, you can immediately start to see what this all means. Ganesh, as the lord of knowledge and wisdom, is the chief general of Shiva's armies. His brother, Skanda, is also the god of war and the general of Shiva's armies. What sort of war are we talking about? It is the Maha Bharata's war, in which Krishna advises Arjuna to battle against himself. The generals that lead the armies of God are Ganesh and Skanda. This symbol is not unique to Hinduism. We see these two brothers who work together in other traditions also. I mentioned already Egyptian mythology in which we see Horus as the agent of the divine and he has his brother Set. And the core myth of Egyptian mythology or Egyptian mysteries is the relationship between Horus and Set, and the conflict and ultimate resolution of that relationship provides the dramatic background for Egyptian mysteries. In Egypt, Horus and Set have been represented in many ways. But in this particular image, you can see them as equals, 
both pulling on a central rod, a jed. And that jed, it's hard to see in this image because it's quite small, has notches all the way up. That jed represents the spinal column. That's our spinal column. And Horus and Set represent forces or energies, archetypes in us that are working to stabilize that spinal column to make it stand upright. And the way they do that is by playing off each other. In the Egyptian mysteries, Set places obstacles and Horus overcomes them. This is all Ganesha. Ganesha is the one who places obstacles and also the one who overcomes them. In this sense, we can see he works hand in hand with his brother, Skanda. We don't have time to go in detail into the story of Skanda, but we might in a future lecture. It's very interesting. We also see the two brothers in the Judaic tradition with Abraham and Lot. What's significant here is Abraham, or Ibrahim. In Judaism and Christianity, Abraham is known, of course, as the great patriarch, also of Islam. So these three great world religions are all due to Ibrahim, Abraham. In other words, Abraham is a lord of hosts. Abraham is the father of many generations of spiritual devotees. And that's why in the Bible it says, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Abraham, Ibrahim, is Ganesh in the Judaic tradition, in the Christian tradition. So in the Zohar, we see that Abraham is pointed out as being the secret of Chesed. And Chesed is the fourth Sephirah down in the Tree of Life. So when we talk about how the ray of creation unfolds on the Tree of Life, we explain that the upper trinity, the three in one, create through the third Sephirah, Binah. That process of creation is symbolized in Hinduism and Buddhism as two gods united sexually. And in Judaism and in Kabbalah, that, uni that union is called Da'at, which means knowledge. That is the nature of Tantra. Da'at is a hidden Sephirah that appears in the middle between the upper trinity and the second trinity. And it represents the secret knowledge of sexuality related to the divine. That union of God and goddess of Elohim results in creation, but divine creation, immaculate conception, a way of giving birth in a superior level, which has nothing to do with our animality. The result of that Symbolically in the tree, in Kalah is Chesed, the fourth Sephirah. That is Abraham, symbolically speaking, as an archetype. That is Abraham in us, or Ibrahim. The reason this is important to understand is because of Ganesha's name, Buddhi Priya. Buddhi Priya means fond of Buddhi, or husband of Buddhi. So when Ganesh is represented as having a spouse, one of the representations is his spouse is called Buddhi. Buddhi is a Sanskrit word that means wisdom. It can also be translated as intellect or intelligence. Sometimes Ganesh is represented as having three wives, Buddhi, Riddhi, and Siddhi. These are all symbolic. When we see 
stories and representations of the gods having multiple wives, they're not committing adultery. These are symbolic representations of divine forces that are moving deep within our consciousness. Buddhi means wisdom or knowledge, intelligence. Riddhi means prosperity. And Siddhi means powers or attainment. This, is, this symbolism is part of the reason why people in uh, the exoteric levels of religion have taken Ganesha as their deity or god because they want material prosperity. And so you may find images hanging in shops in banks and restaurants that have Ganesha and Lakshmi standing side by side because Lakshmi is the goddess of prosperity and Ganesha is the god of prosperity. So those businesses want to make money. So they think if they hang the picture of the god there, the god will be very impressed and give them money. It doesn't work like that. Really, Ridhi means spiritual prosperity karmic or dharmic prosperity. And how do we acquire dharmic prosperity? Through self-knowledge. Through kriya, which is action. Spiritual action. Siddhi means attainment or powers. And cities relate to the powers of the consciousness. These are given to us by Ganesha. They have to be earned. These powers are the ability to have samadhi, the ability to astral project, to awaken the chakras, to remember our past lives, to have telepathy, to have all the different types of spiritual powers that we love to read about. These are cities. They are powers that have to be earned and that are granted as a boon by God. They can never be earned through any kind of trick, through any kind of clever technique. God cannot be fooled. God bestows on the one who earns it, who deserves it. So Buddhi Priya, as the name of Ganesha, shows that he is married or united to or in love with Buddhi, wisdom, knowledge. Again, this is symbolic. It doesn't mean there's an elephant-headed guy in heaven who's married to a girl named Buddhi. This is symbolic of our psychology. So when we study the tree of life, we see what Buddhi is on the tree of life. It is the fifth sephira down the tree of life, directly across from Chesed. In Hebrew, it is called Geburah. Chesed and Geburah represent two very subtle but very important aspects of our inner psychology. Chesed in Hinduism is also called Atman, which means self. Chesed is our spirit. It is what in the Bible is called the Father, our inner Father. Not the divine, unmanifested, ultimate level the father of the universe. No, our personal inner father, our inner guru, our inner divinity, our source, our spark, our true inner self, who also has his own true inner self, which is the unmanifest. Atman is our inner Buddha. Atman is, is Ganesh. Ganesha, when he first is born of Shiva Shakti, also expresses out from himself Buddhi, which is his knowledge, his wisdom. That is his spouse. It is the divine soul, our divine consciousness, which in other religions is represented as Helen of Troy, Eurydice, Beatrice from the Divine Comedy, Guinevere, and the Arthurian legends. And in the Arthurian legends, our innermost, or Chesed, would be Arthur, the king. 
In Kabbalah, we understand that chesed has some important planetary significance. And one of the important planets related to it is Jupiter. Jupiter is the king, the royalty. And that is Ganesha, the king or master, the ruler of the armies, the one who's in charge in our psychological universe. He is our inner king, whom, unfortunately, we have betrayed. So Buddhidatta is another name of Ganesha, which means giver of buddhi. In other words, when we want to acquire spiritual knowledge, direct experience of the divine, to talk with God, we need buddhi, wisdom, that spiritual knowledge, and that comes through Ganesha, our innermost, our Atman. He is the one who gives that, not only as our soul is created, but through our experiences, through our spiritual experiences, through our spiritual enlightenment, our spiritual development, the knowledge and wisdom that we acquire comes from Ganesha, our innermost. How does that come? Through obstacles. He's the one who places the obstacles. We have to face them and overcome them. And when we overcome them, he removes them. And he gives us buddhi. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding, comprehension. So here we see all these symbols on the tree of life. We see the upper trinity, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, and their spouses. We see Da'at, which is that level through which the upper trinity creates. The three in one become two in order to unite and create. And the result of that creation is Atman, Ganesha, who then unfolds through all of the power he inherits from the Trinity, his knowledge, which is Buddhi. This is helping us to understand another name for Ganesha, which is Sarvatman. Sarvatman is another name of Ganesha, and that name means literally the whole person. So a lot of Hindus think, why is Ganesha called the whole person? Now you know why. Because our true identity, our true nature as a whole person is to be united with these levels. It is not to have money. It is not to have the latest fashion or be successful materially in the world. It is to be united with God. And that union is direct knowledge of these levels inside of us. To be an embodiment of that is to become Sarvatman, a really, truly whole person. Such a person is like Buddha or Krishna or Rama. Someone who truly was a whole person and still is a whole person. Such a person in their every action, embodies the virtues of the gods. Not merely talking about those qualities or admiring them, but is them. In which there is no distinction in them between themselves and humility, because they are humility. Between themselves and chastity, because they are pure chastity pure happiness for others, pure compassion, pure intelligence, pure wisdom. Such a person is Sarvatman, a whole person. And until we've acquired that, we are not whole. And that's why we always feel that something is missing, an emptiness, something lacking. We're always trying to fill that feeling of emptiness with material things, with sensations, with going here and going there, with traveling, with buying things, with selling things, with making a profit. But all of those pursuits are a reflection of our deep ignorance. The only thing that can fill our heart and our soul and our mind is divinity. It is for us to unite with that and become that. And then we become Sarvatman, a whole person. 
Here on the Tree of Life, we see how all of this relates. The upper triangle represents those levels of divinity that are hard for us to grasp because they are subtle and beyond our immediate perception. But lower down, we see the lower seven spheres. And as we explained in the first lecture, these are the manifested level of Prakriti. They are impure in us because of our avidya, our ignorance. But if we work to purify them, we can unite all of this as one. And that is self-realization. To realize, to know the entirety of oneself. Not just as a theory, but through direct knowledge, through vidya. This is called Brahma Vidya. It is knowledge of God. These seven lower spheres from the, the top one is Chesed, which is our spirit, represented by Ganesha. This is Atman. The next is Gebra, represented by Buddhi. And this is our consciousness, the divine consciousness, which is the repository of God's knowledge. Not our knowledge, not our intellect, the Buddhi of Ganesha. Just below that on the Tree of Life, we see represented Tiferet. This is willpower, the human soul. This is that part of us from which we do have some degree of knowledge. This is our willpower, our volition. Unfortunately, that volition, our willpower, is trapped in desire. Our willpower is all caught up in the will to survive, in the will to succeed, in the will to acquire money or fame or recognition, to be respected, to be loved, to be honored. Very little of our will is focused on God. And if you don't believe that, look at how you live your life from day to day. How much of your thoughts, feelings, and actions are purely focused on knowing God. Not concerned about other things. You might be doing other things. So when you wash the dishes, are you remembering God? When you're at work, are you remembering God? When you're watching that boy or girl walk down the street, are you remembering God? That will tell you how much willpower you have free of desire. The average, we say, amongst modern people is we have 3% not yet trapped in desire. Only a fraction of consciousness is unmodified by desire. And every once in a while, that little fraction will get inflamed with enthusiasm for spirituality. And we'll have some experience of the divine, whether in a waking state or in a dream state. But very quickly, that experience is converted into fanaticism, into fear. That longing is, concerted, is converted into politics, into fighting amongst groups. It's very rare for anyone to preserve intact that small fraction of free will that sincerely longs to know divinity and will sacrifice anything to have it. Most people who make sacrifices in a spiritual or religious way do it for selfish purposes. They become a monk or a nun because they don't want to work. They don't want to have a regular job. They don't like society. They want to escape pain and suffering. It's not really about God for them. It's about selfishness. It's not really about serving others for them. It's really about serving themselves. Same for those who become monks and nuns, priests, who join a school or a movement, not because they sincerely want to know God, but because they sincerely are tired of being in pain. These are different. We have to be sincere with ourselves and analyze our behaviors to really understand where we are so that we can truly change. 
As long as we have illusions about ourselves, especially spiritual illusions, we will remain in maya, in illusion. The next sefra down is, in, 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 the Sanskrit, or in the Hebrew, is netzach, which relates to the mind, to the intellect. It's called the mental body. And this connects with our physical brain. The next down is hod, which relates to the astral body, to our emotions. And then we have yasod, which is our vital energy. And finally, malkut is the physical body. These sephiroth are multidimensional. Only the bottom one, malkut, is third dimensional. The rest are not physical. They connect to our physicality because all of these dimensions interpenetrate each other. We have feelings now if, we, if our heart is at all able to sense any feelings, those feelings that we sense are the reflections of what's happening in Hod, in the astral body, which is in the fifth dimension. The thoughts that we sense physically are the reflection of Netzach, the mental body, which is in the fifth dimension. And likewise, will or Tiferet is in the sixth dimension. And we have impulses to act and to do things those impulses to act and do things are our willpower. But unfortunately, that will is usually modified. It's usually reflected through thoughts and feelings that are corrupted with desire. So what does all this mean? It means we need the help of Ganesha, our innermost. Here we see three images of how Ganesha is represented in Buddhism. To understand these images, we need to understand that Buddhism came from Hinduism. Every form of Buddhism came from Hinduism. If you want to understand Buddhism, you must understand Hinduism, because they're the same tradition. Hinduism is the root symbolism that nurtured and fed the Buddhist traditions all over the world. There are many Buddhists who reject Hinduism to their own detriment. And they fail to understand Buddhism because of that. These three paintings come from uh, Tibetan traditions in relation with Ganesha. Ganesha is known in all forms of Buddhism, except some uh, modern forms of Zen that have uh, extracted almost everything out of their traditions. Ganesha represents the obstacle placer and the obstacle remover. And so in Buddhism, this is what he primarily is related to. It's important to note that Buddha Shakyamuni himself taught about Ganesha. There is a sutra in which the Buddha Shakyamuni teaches the mantra of Ganesha. And the reason he teaches the mantra is in order to remove obstacles. The Buddha Shakyamuni said, if any of my followers are in a place in which there are obstacles that are interfering with what they're trying to do, chant this mantra and their efforts will be successful. And so he gave a long mantra that has Ganesha as the driving force, and the name Ganesha is in the mantra. So Buddhism does not exclude Ganesha and does not um, disparage Ganesha. Buddhism is built on it, on the knowledge of Ganesha. In fact, uh, if you've studied Chinese or Japanese Buddhism, Chinese-Japanese religions in general, you'll find that most of the gods came from Hindu gods. And the names have just been altered to fit the language of each location. And Ganesha is no exception to that. This first image represents how to overcome obstacles. This image is an ancient Buddhist painting of Vignataka trampling on Vinayaka. And so the upper image we see the multi-armed, blue-skinned, ferocious deity standing on top of an elephant-headed god. 
The second image shows Ganesha as that fierce divinity with many arms. And the third image shows the blue-skinned deity trampling on an elephant lying flat. Some foolish people have interpreted these images to say that Buddhism has trampled Hinduism. This is false. What these stories actually represent is Shiva teaching his son. The blue-skinned deity that you see here is Krishna. Krishna means blue or black. Krishna is Christ. Krishna is the solar logos, the upper trinity. He is the trikaya. Krishna is dharmakaya, sambhogakaya, nirmanakaya. Krishna is Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu. This blue-skinned deity is Krishna as Shiva. He represents the power of divinity on the un unmanifested level, the archetypal level, who's going to create. For him to do that, he has to overcome the obstacles. And those obstacles are karma. What karma? Ours. All of our mistaken actions from our ignorance have created a huge problem for our inner divinity. Our inner divinity needs to advance spiritually, but cannot because of our stupidity. Yes, God needs us. Our innermost needs us in order for our innermost to advance. So our inner Shiva, who in this case is called Mahakala, is teaching his son, Atman, about how to dissolve the ego. How to eliminate obstacles. That's what these images represent. This is Shiva, Mahakala, standing on top of Ganesha, teaching him about the ferocity needed, the energy needed, in order to overcome obstacles, in order to advance spiritually. The second image is Ganesha doing that. He's called Maharakta, which means the great red lord of hosts. That red is all the fire and passion, the energy of divinity. And that red is feminine. It is the power of the Divine Mother. It is Durga. So that's why we see these red flames around them all and the red skin on Ganapati or Ganesha here. And this third one is Mahakala, with Ganesha under his feet, but also a flayed elephant skin wrapped around him. The same one here. That represents how Ganesha is learning from Shiva how he needs to guide his soul. Us. So these images are very important in tantric iconography. They teach all about how we need to eliminate our obstacles with the help of God. Now, I mentioned that Ganesha is known in other traditions outside of India. And in Japan, Ganesha is known in a secret tradition that's not widely uh, known about, in which Ganesha is known as Kangiten which means deity of joy. And this tradition is very secret. It's very difficult to find any representations of Kangatan because traditionally these images were always kept in secret temples, in private, and only initiates, people who had taken vows, not only could see them, but knew what they meant. Now this tradition of Kangatan, naturally, like every other tradition, has degenerated. It has degenerated into a form of black tantra that has spread in many places. The original form of Kangatan is related with white tantra. And you can see in this image, Ganesha is shown embracing his wife. And this image was kept in secret in temples in China and Japan as a representation of the tantric mysteries through which a couple would collaborate 
in order to harness the power to overcome obstacles. Nowadays, this, is, this has degenerated into uh, an object worship in which couples collect these little statues and pray to them so they can have children or they can have financial success. And that is a degeneration. That is not the tradition of Congathan. That is a deep misunderstanding of the original purpose of these symbols. The real meaning of Kangaten, it can be found when we understand Ganesha in relation with his other primary symbol, which is the swastika. So now we've seen that Ganesha has some very significant symbols that represent him. The Om and the swastika. The swastika, of course, is a four-armed cross in movement. If you've studied Gnostic tradition at all, you know that the cross is a sexual symbol that represents the crossing of male and female. And when that cross moves, it spins and becomes this symbol, the cross in movement. This represents the power of the third logos, or the Holy Spirit, in action. The reason this is important in relation with Ganesha is because, firstly, he is the outcome of the swastika and movement in the superior worlds. When Shiva and Shakti unite, their child is Ganesha, the innermost, Chesed, our Atman, our true inner Buddha. In other words, this is why we see the swastika on images of Buddhas, especially Amitabha. Images of Amitabha generally have a swastika in his chest. Jain sculptures also have this, but in Buddhism, Amitabha has a swastika. The swastika is universally in Asia a positive symbol. Unfortunately, the Nazis in Germany appropriated it and corrupted it like we've done with so many symbols. But the swastika itself does not mean anything evil. In fact, it's probably the most sacred symbol in Hinduism. It is a symbol of good luck, of prosperity, of creation, of growth, of evolution, of goodwill. It is the most positive, prosperous symbol, and that's why it's related with Ganesha. Ganesha is the one who brings prosperity, who overcomes obstacles, who connects us to God. What connects us to God is the power of the cross in movement. It is the crossing of male and female in movement, meaning that the energy is preserved in the cross. It is not wasted. When the energy of the cross is preserved and made sanctified, when it is held as divine, what is the outcome? It is an immaculate conception. It is creation of the soul, of virtue, of the spirit. This is the reason why yoga requires brahmacharya. Brahmacharya means uh, complicated to translate it directly. Basically, brahmacharya is talking about chastity and re restraining the sexual energy in order to nourish it and feed our divinity, to give it to God. Brahmacharya has two levels. First is the level at which someone first enters a religion and as a single person with restraining the energy, sexual energy, in order to purify it and learn how to control it. And the second level is when that person enters into a marriage and they learn to work with that energy in order to preserve it and elevate it to make it a vehicle of divine forces. The swastika represents that and Ganesha is the one who makes it possible. The sexual energy, of course, is at the root of the spine. Sexual energy is that energy that gives us life and lets us create life. And is at the root of the spinal column. So when we look at the human body, we see the spine goes from the sexual organs to the mind, to the brain. 
spiritual development depends on that sexual energy being purified and rising up the spinal column. For it to begin that process, it must leave the base of the spine where it is contained. And that place is called the kanda. It is a region of nervous filaments at the base of the spinal column that connects together many connections of energy or nadis in the body. That energy is encapsulated in what's called the muladhara chakra. This is an energy vortex at the base of the spine. Mula means origin or root. And you remember in the previous lecture, we explained mula prakriti, which is the root of nature. And I talked about that energy of nature has static and kinetic levels. In us, the energy of the Divine Mother, the fire of the Holy Spirit, is static. It is latent. It is asleep. When we learn the secret knowledge of Tantra, we learn to restrain the sexual energy and activate it through our devotion to God and through our charity and through our sanctity. That energy can be activated in these chakras. In other words, the static energy can be converted to kinetic energy. Who does that? Ganesha, the Lord of Beginnings, whose symbol is the swastika. That swastika, the four-armed cross, is Muladhara Chakra, which has four petals. And the symbol of the Muladhara Chakra is an elephant which is Ganesha. The power that's trapped in the Muladhara Chakra is the power of Shiva and Shakti. For that power to be awakened, Ganesha has to do it. And Ganesha will only do that when we earn it. When we earn through the application of the science and through the overcoming of obstacles, the awakening of that fire, it can begin to rise in the spinal column. That is how we acquire the three consorts of Ganesha. Buddhi, wisdom. Riddhi, prosperity. Siddhi, attainment. This is how Ganesha and his spouse, his, his wives, become active in us through the spinal column, through level to level up the vertebrae, through the chakras. But it begins in Muladhara. That's why Shivananda explained that without the grace of Sri Ganesha and his help, nothing whatsoever can be achieved. No action can be undertaken without his support, grace, or blessing. So Ganesha represents our innermost, our Atman. Without his grace, we cannot accomplish anything spiritually. He is the Lord of beginnings. This is why in the Gnostic tradition, we always emphasize self-remembering. To remember God. To always remember the inner self. To always, whatever we approach as an action, whatever we want to do, to ask that it be done in accordance with God, with our inner God. When we say a prayer, when we say a mantra, we always say, may thy will be done. That will is the will of Tiferet. If we look into the tree of life, we see this middle triangle, Hesed, Gebra, and Tiferet. Hesed is Atman, or, Geb or uh, Ganesha. His knowledge his wisdom is Gebra. His will is Tiferet. So when we say, thy will be done, it is an invocation for him to act through Tiferet. For him to do what must be done. For his glory, not for our own. Unfortunately, we take that will and corrupt it. We might say, God, let your will be done, but then we do what we want anyway. It doesn't really work like that. 
So if we want to really understand something about Ganesha and these symbols, we can begin with that. Learning how to remember God. Praying to God. With whatever we do, whatever we want, whatever we will, to remember God. Do you have any questions? Hmm. I think everybody fell asleep. Yeah, the pentagram, the, pentagram. the pentagram fits into the tree of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the union of those. The pentagram fits onto the tree of life a number of ways. That's one way. Yep. Sarvatman. No questions, really? Nobody had coffee today? <laughs> Wow. I think everybody's totally asleep. What is the fifth uh, Sophia place in the tree of life? The place of peace to Sophia in the tree of life? Uh, the entire tree of life is represented throughout the peace to Sophia. Everything that happens in peace to Sophia encompasses the entire tree of life. So if you look in that text and you study it, you'll discover that all of the repentances, all of the eons relate to Sephiroth on the Tree of Life. And that would take many lectures to explain. That's why there's a big, thick book about it. So I'd recommend reading that and studying that. There are some graphics in the Glorian edition that help explain how the Tree of Life relates to the teachings of that book. That's a good question. So the question is about, in every lecture we talk about knowing yourself, and this time we're saying it's Ganesha. So how does Ganesha relate to that self, and how do we understand that? Firstly, let me explain that Ganesha is simply an archetype. Uh, in other words, a symbol. Ganesha is a form that God uses in order to teach. So in every pantheon or every re region of the world, God ex unfolds in different ways in order to teach the people of that region according to their psychology. So in the Aztec culture, those people who were serious about learning about God perceived impressions of divinity through their spiritual experiences that related to them psychologically. So they saw Quetzalcoatl, they saw Kukulkan, and they saw different things depending on what they needed to understand in relation with their psychology and their karma. Similarly, in Hinduism, serious spiritual aspirants have, shown, have been shown forms and images of God related to their psychology and that relate to their culture so they can understand what those things mean. But ultimately, all of these symbols bear the same meanings, same importance. That's why we explain that throughout all these different traditions, all of these different symbols point to the same thing. We have students from every religion. And some students will feel more um, affinity with Hinduism, some with Christianity, some with Judaism. And they should use those symbols that they feel drawn towards and feel natural with. Because we don't need additional obstacles in our spiritual work. We need to work with the forces and energies from above that correspond with our own psychological idiosyncrasy. We're talking about Ganesha in this course because for those who have that idiosyncrasy of Southeast Asian mythology, 
that symbol is very accessible for them. Whereas for someone who doesn't have that background, it may seem very foreign. So we point this out so that you can understand that these symbols are simply that. They're just symbols. The reality is our self has no form. Atman also is formless. Atman is an expression of God at a certain condensation or crystallization of nature in a very superior level. And that level, that form of God, can appear to us in many forms. In my personal experience, I have seen my Atman. Not that I'm special. I'm not different from anyone else or deserve anything other than anyone else. But because of my work spiritually, I've been granted that vision a few times, and he's looked different every time from different religions. And that's probably because in my past lives, because I've been a bad person, I've been living in many cultures all over the world and had these idiosyncrasies at different times with different traditions. So I love all religions, partly because of that. So he shows me those images of himself for that reason. Partly so that I'll understand that, and secondly, so I won't get attached. Ganesha is just an image of something that's ultimately without an image. So our real self is like that, Atman. But let me point out something really important about that. As much as we need to pray to God and grasp at God and long for God, we need to do it in the right way. Not building idols of God in the mind or the heart. Not to build images or structures or beliefs or concepts about God. But instead, to get rid of all of that and open the heart and mind to the reality of God. This is different. There are millions and millions and millions of people in the world who've built huge cathedrals in their minds to God. But there's no God there. Because that construction is man-made. Samuel and Vior said something very beautiful that sticks with me all the time. He said, God seeks out the nothingness in order to fill it. And when we're full of something, there's no room for God. So if we're full of an image of God, or full of attachment to a particular tradition, there's no room for God. We need to open the heart and mind in order to perceive the reality. To not project an image as a construct or as an idol, but to use the images as doorways. If you take an image, any image of divinity, and meditate on it properly, it will open up and show you new things. But unfortunately, what most people do is they meditate on the image, but they try to hold it together. They try to make it rigid and, and very um, limited. They constrain it. So they constantly make effort to make it a form instead of letting it change and letting it open up. So there's a kind of um, flexibility that you need in your visualization practice in order to understand what that means. Any other question? Well, when we study the Tree of Life, we see every type of geometric shape. In the in Da'at, we do see two triangles united. But surrounding that, from, the, from Keter to Chesed to Bina to Chokmah and back to Geberah, you can see a pentagram. So that's what we were describing. This is part of the geometry of God. But really, again, the tree of life and that structure is simply symbolic. Every type of geometrical shape exists in nature because they're all made by God. And the tree of life can be disarranged and rearranged in many ways according to what we're trying to understand. So we shouldn't be limited by the structures. Could you explain the name Jehovah on the tree of life? <laughs> The name Jehovah on the Tree of Life has many meanings and correspondences. In particular, it relates to the upper triangle, Jehovah, 
or Jahava, which relates to Adam and Eve, the primordial creative force of Shiva Shakti. To go deeper into that, we have an entire website and some 60 or 70 books that talk about the different aspects of Jahava and the different meanings, especially the book Secret Teachings of Moses, which I would recommend as a very good introduction to the meanings of the Hebrew names of God. Any questions? Yeah, it's closely related. Deity yoga, strictly speaking, is a tantric tradition uh, that's most known in Tibetan Buddhism, but it's actually part of any Mahayana level and above type of teaching. Even in Hinduism, you have deity yoga in certain groups. Deity yoga, strictly defined, refers to a tantric technique in which a person literally visualizes themselves to be their deity. So this is a different, it's a, it's a more secret level from the more uh, beginner level of that, which is bhakti yoga. And bhakti yoga, which is common in Hinduism and Buddhism, the person just, like in Christianity, worships God as an outside force. The person sings songs, mantras, bhajans, kirtans, uh, does devotional practices as an expression of love for God as a demonstration of devotion to Krishna or to Shiva or any, any other representation of divinity. The next level up is deity yoga, in which the person literally begins to imagine that they are that God and that God is them. And the reason that that practice is done is in order for us to learn about virtue so that we stop being so identified with the ego. Because right now, we're very much identified with our pride, with our lust, with our anger. And we'd feel very disconnected from God. So through the practice of deity yoga, you visualize and imagine in your meditation practice that that God is in you, and you are that God. And that is a way of starting to look at the ego from a different perspective, so that you see it for what it is. It's a very powerful technique. But it's very dangerous for those who are not properly trained, because they can build a lot of pride and start to think, well, I am that God. I don't need to change. I'm already that God. That pride is just my pride. It's divine pride. And there are many people who believe that, sincerely believe it. And of course, they become demons. Very, very deceptive demons. So the importance of understanding that is underscored in the writings and teachings of Sama Lembuyor. He does teach deity yoga in a synthesized way in his practices and techniques. There are a lot of meditation practices in which we repeat, I am he. Right? And those are deity yoga practices in which we literally are starting to visualize and imagine that God is in us. It is us. We are that. But to understand that is not easy for us because we have so much ego. Uh, but being successful in that effort is truly the basis of theurgy, which was the nature of your question. True theurgy is a person who's able to act on the will of God for the benefit of others, not for oneself. Theurgy, in that sense, means magic or ritual. A theurgist invokes the power of their innermost in order to aid others. And in this tradition, we have hundreds and hundreds of techniques of theurgy. And there's a book called Logos Mantra Theurgy in which it's packed with exercises in order to develop the ability to be a true theurgist. But as you mentioned, that power is 100% contingent on knowing the innermost and being able to be a facilitator of his powers. And we can't do that if we're filled with pride or filled with lust or anger. We can't because he won't come into that environment. He won't empower our anger or our pride because it will create more obstacles for him too. It's interesting that you mentioned that too because Ganesha has a lot of um, correspondence with magic and theurgy and ritual. So it's deeply related. Any other questions?
Uh, that uh, Logos Mantra Theurgy is now in that book, The Divine Science, which is a collection of books. Would it be better to pray to, to your Divine Mother all time instead of using the deities? Can we use the Divine Mother to represent all? Should we spend time praying to other aspects of God as well? Should we spend our time praying to the Divine Mother or to different aspects or images of the deities? You should pray to whatever aspect or symbol of God pulls at your heart. Simple as that. When we study Gnosis, and we study religions, we're using the intellect in order to acquire or gather information, in order to understand all traditions and all religions, in order to encourage ourselves to penetrate deeper into the truth. But the intellect cannot take us to God. As many images or symbols as we may understand or know about the names, and as many hierarchies and pantheons as, as we have examined and studied and placed them all perfectly on the tree of life, that's all meaningless if we have no relationship in our heart with it. You have to look to your own heart for those symbols and representations of God that call to you. They can be Hindu, they can be Buddhist, Aztec, Nordic, Taoist, from any tradition, Greek, or absolutely formless. But the ultimate point, the doorway is going to be in your heart. So I have friends who are Sufi, and I have friends who are Buddhists, and I have friends who are Christians. And all of them use different symbols for the same thing. The symbol is ultimately irrelevant as long as it opens the doors of your heart. As long as you are praying sincerely from your heart. Not from your mind, but from your heart. You can use any symbol you want. The symbol of divinity that pulls at you, that calls you, that inspires you. Is that has anything to do with sun at midnight? Dot? These are Kabbalistic questions today, huh? The sun of midnight is related with Christ. And Dot is definitely related to that, and I believe there are a few lectures about that uh, on Gnostic Radio. Do you remember which one that was? About the sun of midnight? It's a lecture that you gave. It's Christ, but which lecture was that? You gave a lecture all about that. Yeah, it was in many lectures. I can't remember the name specifically. There's one in particular that's in my memory, but anybody remember? Okay, you guys all failed. <laughs> there are many lectures about that, but the sun at midnight is Christ, and of course that's related with Dad, because that's the process through which Christ emerges into the world. Any other questions? So is Om the mantra for Ganesha? Yes, Om is the mantra for Ganesha. There are many others, um, but the simplest is simply Om. Anything else? Okay. That's right. This image shows a cow, which is always accompanying divinity. The cow represents the Divine Mother. Uh, and those shapes in the sides of this particular image, on both sides you see um, lingams. These are Shiva lingas, which are ritual statues that represent the power of Shiva. And they are the foundation stone, Yasod. They are a stone in the shape of a phallus, and they are held as sacred objects in most forms of Hinduism. And these are decorated with flowers and with sacred writings. And these are, in front of them are mantras in the shape of offerings. So the Shiva Linga we'll talk about in other lectures, but Samai Alam Vyor addressed that in many of the books, Turan Kabla and a few others. He talked about the Shiva Linga. Anything else? Okay, any other questions here? Okay, thank you.
To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,